Okay. Uh, thank you for having me here again. It's wonderful to be here again at NG Europe. Uh, my name is Matthias. I work on the Angular core team at Google in California. I'm here to talk about how animations and layouts play a role with NG Animate and Angular 2. So about myself, uh, I've been involved in Angular for almost four years now. I started off by blogging and contributing to the framework, and that led to doing animation work, and then that led to a job at Google in California. And uh, the website that I have, yearofmoo.com, has been redesigned, and I'm going to be blogging more about Angular now that the website's finished. Okay, so here are the links to the slides and the code examples. The slides that I have are the ones that you see on screen. And within these slides, I have a variety of demos <coughs> which uh, go over some of the animation examples. So I'll, I'll tweet out these links once the animation's, uh, once, <laughs> once the presentation's done, and uh, we can go from here. Okay, so as I mentioned in my title, we have a mixture of animations and layouts the player role with NG Animate and Angular 2. So let's talk about both of these. Animations, we know, and we can safe to say that animations are layout driven. That means that some kind of a layout change triggers an animation. Now typically, the animation code is run through CSS or through web animations, and those take over the animation and run it. In AngularJS and Angular 2, we have an animation system that allows us to define these animations that are triggered when these layout changes happen. Now for layouts, layouts, we can safe to say it's a, a foundational mix of CSS and HTML. And it's also safe to say that Angular manipulates the layout via the template bindings and structures that we have in place. So let's talk about the basics of Angular animations. Well, for those of you who used it, Animations are defined in the component. And uh, we have an animation syntax, which is a part of a DSL, that allows us to specify how things are animated and how long they're animated and what styles are applied. The triggers that, that cause the animations to run are state-based. So if we have a state that says on or off, or visible and visible, or enter or leave, this will trigger an animation to run. The code looks like this. Here we have a trigger called my animation. And when the state of my animation has changed, tell this animation to run. So the DSL, which is the part that takes over and runs the animation, is a mixture of functional composition and styling. All the code that you see in the animation examples are platform agnostic, which means that we could take the animation code that we have, port it to iOS or port it to Android, and those run as we expect them to. And with Angular 2's ahead of time compilation, this is AOT friendly. So that means that all the animation code that you make will be optimized and ready to be animated as soon as the application has been started. And once again, we don't use CSS keyframes or transitions. Now what that means is since we don't use CSS to drive the animations, that means that we just use another system, which I'll talk about next, to run these animations, but we still borrow the philosophy of CSS-based animations and keyframes. And the big benefit we get from this is that we're not dependent on the DOM, which once again would allow other platforms to run animations in the exactly same way. So what we use is the Web Animations API. And the Web Animations API is supportive of Chrome and Firefox, and Safari has it in their technical preview, and Edge is working on it. So for now, when you're developing an Angular 2 application, include the Web Animations polyfill, and you'll have animations working perfectly in Angular 2. So for those of you have, who have used the Web Animations API, you can see here that we have an animation that animates something from zero to one in opacity. That looks like, well, right there, it doesn't really look too clean because we have very strict data. We have to know all the styles up front. We have to know exactly what element it's being animated on. And if we were to pause that animation and run it to something else, it would be very troublesome. So this is where Angular plays a role, because Angular works on top of web animations, but it does all kinds of cool stuff within the framework to optimize for styling, for layout effects, and for animating on multiple elements so that you don't have to deal with such low-level code. So if we take a look at, again at our example, this code will transform into this when we use it in Angular 2's animation code. Here we're basically saying that when this state occurs, we jump state from this state to this state, 
animate it from opacity zero to an opacity of one over one second. So the big benefits we get from having this DSL approach instead of a CSS approach to animations is that we can manipulate and manage the, f the language of the animation code ourselves. We can optimize things behind the scenes, we can add testing support, and we're not tied to the DOM, we're not tied to one specific platform. So once again, you make your animations work in the DOM, you can make them work in iOS and Android as well. So there are two ways to trigger animations in Angular. You can either have them in the template or you can have them a part of the component bindings and have an annotation that sits on top of the binding. <coughs> Here we're saying that when the trigger has changed state, the animation will be fired. And what that looks like, which we'll see in this example right here, is we have a list of months. And what we want to do is we want to make it so when those months are inserted or removed in the page, we want to trigger an animation. Here we're saying that, okay, for an NG4, add this animation called month animation and trigger an enter and a leave. And inside of our DSL code, we're saying transition enter, fire this event, run these animations, transition leave, run these animations as well. Animate for half a second. So let's take a look at the demo. Here I have a list of the months in French. I hide all the months, I show the even months, I show the odd months. The template code is exactly what you saw, an NG4 that lists all the months, and then the animations take over to animate them in and to hide them in the page. And once again, this is a part of the GitHub demo code that I have linked to my slides. Okay, so let's take a look at one more example. Here we have an open and close component where when we toggle the open and close, we want to fire an animation to show and hide the contents. I click on the toggle, open goes to false, and when it's open, we will emit the open value, and when it's closed, we'll emit the closed value. So this slide open value right here is the trigger that's fired. And then when that's fired, we're allowed to pass values into the open state and pass values into the closed state. We're basically saying that when it's closed, the height is zero, and when it's open, the height is a star. And the star means that the value will be detected at runtime to figure out what the true height of the element is. And once we jump around between open and closed, animate it for half a second with an easing as well. If we take a look at our demo here, you can see that we're opening and closing. The height is being computed at the right time. If I were to shrink the window or increase the font size, you can see that it's adjusting to the sizing that's required. Okay, so we can also tap into events when the animation is finished using the at symbol and parentheses syntax and having a dot start or a dot done. And what this will return is an event that tells us how long the animation is run for and what the starting state and the destination state were. If our slide open code contained the starting and styling callbacks, we can use them in this way. And this brings us to a third demo where I have here a gallery of images, uh, some pictures of France, pictures of uh, macaroons and cool things. As I click these, you can see that there's a loading indicator that loads, and once the loading animation is finished, then it swaps the image. So this is a classic example of having the loading animation tell us when it's time to replace content in the page. So how does this stuff work? Well, there are three steps. First, Angular will take the animation code that it has, prepare it, put it into a format that can be easily executed, and when it is executed, we will execute it in the most efficient way, return a player, and once the animation is finished, we will clean up all the code that's necessary for the animation to run. So the parsing stage will basically take all the animation code that you've written, turn it into something called an abstract syntax tree, and that AST code is then passed into the compiler, which will turn it into efficient JavaScript code. This is the code that's produced when we have the ahead of time compilation. So if you run it for the AOT code, you'll have all the animation code ready to be executed right away. So if we had this code defined within our application, once it runs through AOT, it'll be generated into this code. Now you don't have to understand this code, but you can, be, you can rest assured that this code is very efficient JavaScript code that will be executed when the animation has started. And the reason why we do this is to allow for web workers to work, 
because web workers require that there's the app side and there's the UI side and they communicate with each other in the most efficient way. Okay, so features that are available today, we can use the styling. Here I can say that we want to use inline styling. Very soon we'll be able to attach a style sheet directly to our component and pull in styles for the component as well. We can also animate keyframes and styles and specify them by an offset. We can also have any auto style for any CSS property. So the height has a star just like we saw before. And we can animate using easing values and cubic Bezier values and delays as well. By default, all the animation steps that occur are run one by one. But if we want to run animations in parallel, we can run multiple animations in the same element using the group property. One thing we have right now is that when you cancel an animation, it jumps to the end of the animation and continues from there. But next week, we'll have it so that it has proper cancel support so that all animations that are canceled midway don't snap and jump. So features that are coming very soon. The big feature that's coming very soon, in the next few weeks, is query. After that, we'll have CSS partial support and then more programmatic access to our animations. So right now, all the animation code that I've shown is only finding the animation that's been triggered and interacting with that trigger element. But if I wanted to find sub-elements of the animation, I could use query. And now query works exactly the same way as it does with view child and content child. So you can pass in the component type, you can pass in a reference, and it'll be able to find the element that it's trying to animate. So in this example, if I have a header reference and a footer reference, I can find these values, change styles on them, and then using group, I can animate multiple elements at the same time. So our template code looks like this. Here we have a header reference and a footer reference. But using references in general isn't really the most ideal for animation. So we also have another method called select, which can allow us to apply a CSS selector to find elements in the page. And once we have this feature, you'll be able to, <coughs> you'll be able to use CSS selectors with view child and content child as well. So in the demo that I have here, I'm clicking on a modal, and the modal has a header, a body, and a footer, and each of these are animated accordingly. And that is using query to find each of these items and using group to animate them in parallel. So styling CSS, so far we've had inline styles, and inline styles are a little bit tricky because it kind of bloats the amount of code that you have in your component. But it would be nice if we had access to the style sheet. And now this feature, because we have a CSS parser available in Angular 2, we'll be able to pull the classes and the keyframes directly from the style sheet and use them in our components animation. So if we have a component that looks like this where we have an external CSS file, and let's say the external CSS file looks like this, we can read those classes and read the keyframe and pull in that data and use it directly within our animation code. So here we're using these classes and we can use the keyframe as well. So this will promote a nice sense of reusability with animations within the framework. So programmatic player access means that I can actually ask for an animation in my components and then I can get a hold of the player and, tell, and set the player to be a position or reverse or pause and resume the animation as I see fit. So let's say, for example, I have a component that injects the animation and then when I start the animation, it passes in the element ref, I'll have access to the player and I can do all kinds of cool things with this. The demo that we have here, number five, showcases this with an angular, angular emblem jumping across the page. So if I want to access that, I can actually control it frame by frame just by asking for the item in the player and having access to the animation. And because all of this code is defined with the animation DSL, querying will work, CSS parser support will work, and all of the new features will work as well with the programmatic player access. And that brings us to another idea of having programmatic evaluations. So, so far we've had static data such as widths and heights, and the only dynamic data we've had is a star symbol for calculating heights and widths at runtime. <laughs> but, <coughs> but if we had support for an expression syntax, we can actually run animation code to determine dynamic data 
as soon as the animation is executed. So what that would mean is, let's say that we have a ripple animation where it's dependent on you clicking on a part of the page, and the X and Y values must be returned from the click pass into the animation, then how would this work? Well, using the EXPR method, we can call an event that we've made called event XY, and that will return the styling that's necessary for the animation to continue, and then that data will be passed into the animation and then animated accordingly. What you'll be also be able to do is you can implement your own animation player. Let's say you want to animate something on a canvas or using SVG or using another animation library. You can implement the player and return an instance of the player and Angular will, will put it into its animation DSL code as well. Finally, using the expression syntax, we can mix it in with CSS classes and inline styles together so we can have a nice sense of static data and dynamic data and reusable data from our style sheets. Okay, so let's talk about layouts. As I mentioned, animations are a mixture of layouts and, well, anima uh, animations in Angular 2 are layouts and animations mixed together. And uh, we, it's safe to say that when the template updates, we will have an animation that happens, but it's the mixture of templates and CSS that drive the layout of the page. Structures change, bindings change, all this stuff right here is all driven through Angular. So. Angular has knowledge of the template changing, of the layout changing ahead of time. And we can animate these things with animation triggers, and we can also add decorative effects, and so on. But what about CSS? Now, CSS has transitions, and transitions are for element state, so if we add a class or remove a class. But what about actual, like, layout level changes in the page? It's actually pretty hard to animate a choreography of CSS animations because they're all for one element at a time. And let's say that I wanted to have a table that expanded its width and its height. That too is all dependent on how the table has been displayed on the page. Are we using display table? Are we using flex box? Are we actually using a table element? So what I'm getting at is that if we have animation code defined by CSS, it's not really consistent when it comes to animating it. So here I have a grid of items, and this is using Flexbox. Here I'm specifying that we have one column, or two columns, or three columns. Now you might notice that there's a bit of a delay when I switch. And the reason why there's a delay is because I added a CSS transition to it. I specified that when the flex values change, I want to animate it. But this doesn't actually work as we expect it to because CSS transitions are designed to work with Flexbox. Or, well, you could do stuff like this, and it does kind of work, but some items are not animated. And this is tricky because what if you build your whole website this way, and then you want to add animations, and you're like, oh, well, Flexbox doesn't work. I have to use something else. And if you're not that familiar with CSS, it can be tricky. Well, what Angular can do is if you use the state-based system of defining Angular hooks and, sp and specifying widths and heights and so on, Angular can handle the change for you. So if I go to my last demo here, I'm using the same code, but now I'm using Angular system of specifying the column widths and heights. And now Angular can handle the change for me. Now this is a basic animation. Uh, we're not using Flexbox here, but the point is that the more and more that this animation code base gets more and more evolved, we can tap into layout changes automatically because Angular, <coughs> Angular will have knowledge about this stuff as soon as the bindings change. So the end goal then is that Angular will be able to detect layout changes and detect your animation changes and coalesce them together into a combined player. And the more and more evolved this gets, the more automatic it will get. And soon, if we can get this to work, we'll actually have layout CSS transitions and keyframes also be included into the player mix as well. But that ends it for my talk. Here are the slides, once again, and the code examples for me. And uh, I'll be here at the conference if you have more questions about this. Thank you. <laughs>